Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Pat McCormick, President of the City Club, and I'd like to welcome members and guests alike, those of you who are joining us here today in the Governor Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB later, radio later today on OPB's Think Out Loud program. Before we begin the program today, we have some announcements. The generous support of City Club's corporate and media partners ensures that we put on the state's best civic programs week after week. I'd like to thank our media partners, including Oregon Business Magazine, and our Friday Forum winter corporate sponsors, Bank of the Cascades, CenturyLink, Miller Nash, Regents Blue Cross Blue Shield of Oregon, and The Standard. We're grateful for your support and commitment to City Club's mission. Please join me. Please join me in a warm round of applause for all of our corporate and media sponsors. Join us next week at our regular time for a program on youth and violence. Joining us will be three youth from the Multnomah Youth Commission who have been working to develop policy solutions to a wide range of violence triggers they deal with daily, anti-LGBT and gender issues, cyberbullying, gangs, unsafe homes, school bullying, sexual and date violence, and police abuses. Also, tickets are now on sale for Senator Jeff Merkley's address to the City Club on April 5th. He will be talking about how we can save the American dream and reverse the decline of the middle class. You can learn more about City Club programs and events and purchase tickets on our website, pdxcityclub.org. We will be live tweeting today's program. You can follow along and join the conversation today using the hashtag GovTOL. G-O-V-T-O-L. Think Out Loud will take a 90-second break about 20 minutes into the program. At that point, City Club members can come to the microphone and ask questions. We will only take questions from City Club members during our broadcast today. Please only ask one question, and when you ask your question, please ask it as succinctly as possible. Thanks again for joining us today. The program will begin in just a moment and we will be live on OPB shortly after that. Hey everybody, this is Dave Miller from Think Out Loud. Thanks so much for being here. Um, thanks for that intro. We're gonna be starting uh, with uh, a chat. The way the show works, how many of you have heard Think Out Loud on the radio before? Thank you. Um, so you may have heard right before the show starts, or at, at about 11.59, I have a, a little chat with Jason Sauls, our afternoon announcer, where we try to lure people into sticking around uh, at noon to listen to the next show. So that's what we're going to do in about a minute or so. I'll talk to, to Jason and the rest of the state um, for 30 seconds, something like that. And then we'll have five minutes when the rest of the state... Oh, here we go. Stay with us, we have a news update coming up, followed by today's Think Out Loud, and the show is at the City Club of Portland today. Host Dave Miller is there already, of course. Dave, what's ahead in this hour? We're gonna be talking with the governor, Oregon Governor John Kitzhaber, in about five minutes. We're gonna start um, with a big picture at education, education reform and overhaul, but we're gonna also get to healthcare, to public safety, to the proposed and very contentious changes to PERS. We're gonna take questions from our audience here at the Governor Hotel. Also, as always, we'll take questions from people calling in and from our website. A conversation with the governor, an hour with the governor coming up in about five minutes. Think out loud right after the news. Thanks, Dave. Thanks. OPB. All right, now it's all from here, which is, um, which is nice. So um, you guys got the, the basic rundown of how this is going to work. The, the show will start in, uh, in about six minutes, um, and we're going to start by talking about education. Um, as you all know, only City Club members can ask questions um, from the floor here. I, I bet Sam Adams would hate me if I said this, but if you're not a member and you really want to ask a question, um, you could probably leave and get on the phone and try to call in. Not a good idea. <laughs> uh, uh, you also... Um, 
You can also go on our website. If, if you have your phones, if you haven't turned your phones off, please put them on silent. Um, if you are, a tw <laughs> including you. <laughs> He's setting a good example for all of us. Um, if you're a Twitter user, we are, is it GovTOL or TOL? GovTOL is our hashtag for this conversation. Um, how many of you already have a question that you would want to ask right now? A couple. All right. And the, is the mic right there? Where is the mic right now? Can't really see it. It's there. Okay. Um, I have no idea what I'm doing here. I'm you have to oh, I, let me help you with that. Messing around with it here. Here, it might work. There you go. Perfect. Um, so as I, as I mentioned on that quick chat, we're going to be starting with education. Um, we're also, we want to get to larger questions of the budget. We want to talk about, um, about proposed changes to PERS um, from, from the governor's initial proposed budget and the, the Joint Ways and Means uh, proposed budget, the Republican response, also health care. Um, we, we're going to touch on, uh, on the Gary Haugen arguments at the Supreme Court just yesterday uh, and more. Can we test your microphone now that we've put it in place, Governor? Yeah, one, two, three. Are your cell phones off? <laughs> the cell phones off? Does that work? How was your trip to Europe? It was fabulous. Yeah. I saw the picture of you biking uh, in Belgium. And where biking in Belgium. We were at the uh, Nike distribution facility there. It's uh, quite a remarkable, remarkable place. So what, what do you think is going to um, come from that trip for Oregonians? Well, I think one of the main events was this huge uh, tourism and trade show in Berlin. Literally every country in the world is represented there and uh, we think there's a huge uh, market for Oregon tourism and hospitality industry, which is actually one of our larger traded sector industries uh, in, in Europe. Uh, Germany's are, I think, uh, number two to Great Britain. We're trying to pump that up a little bit, so I, I think we'll see some some visitors uh, here in Oregon as a result of that trip. What was your pitch when you were talking to Germans or Belgians or whoever? What did you tell them to try to get them to come to Oregon? Well, first we try to tell them where we are. <laughs> um, you know, I think that... Do we, really, is that, I mean, are you serious that you still I, need to do I, that? I am serious. I mean, you know, people know about California and Washington and uh, so that's a, an important part of it. I think the, the biggest allure is the, uh, well, a couple of things. One. One of the other reasons we went there is celebrating the five-year anniversary of our direct uh, Delta KLM flight to Amsterdam, which actually makes travel here easier. But I think we have this incredible diversity of natural wonder from, you know, two hours from Portland, you can be uh, at the beach skiing on Mount Hood in July, windsurfing in the gorge, or, you know, sipping wine down in, uh, in, in the Willamette Valley. So I think there's a lot of uh, things to recommend the state, and, and we really were just trying to put it, you know, put it on the map. and. Uh, I, I, I suspect will have been quite successful. Anything that's going to stand out most for you from that trip? Well, actually, uh, going to Berlin for the first time, my father was uh, actually in Patton's army and ended up in Berlin in September of 1945. And having read his journals and his diaries, it was pretty uh, moving to, to be there and see all that history and uh, some of the things that he was experiencing back there in, in uh, 1945. It's amazing. I was there a year and a half ago or so, and, and they, um, you can still see everything there. I mean, you can see, you know, buildings with pockmarks in them from, from bullets, and uh, the history is very alive when you go there now. Indeed. We have um, about two minutes right now. Anybody who's afraid to ask a question on the radio, have a, you have a rare opportunity to yell out a question right now. <laughs> Again, I'm gonna, Sam Adams is going gonna to kill me if I keep doing this, but Anybody have a, 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 a question you'd love to ask, but you don't want to ask on the radio? How about an answer you don't want to give on the radio? <laughs> You'll never know. <laughs> you know, I have to tell you, for that question, my chief of staff yesterday gave me a yellow card and a red card from soccer, and you would have got Probably your second yellow on that question. <laughs> this is why we stick to questions that work well on the radio, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And you have about 40 seconds at most.
So you, I will. You know I will, what? I can't I, do that in thirty seconds. So yeah, and maybe so and then we will get for, to that. Um, the, so I apologize. That was evil of me to actually <coughs> ask for questions and then as soon as you ask a, a relevant policy question, say no. But we're going to start in uh, in thirty seconds, and we should give the governor more time to answer that question. We will get to the death penalty <laughs> though in the course of this hour. Um, all right. So we're going to start in twenty seconds. Oh, also, we're going to take two breaks during the show at about 20 past and about 40 past. They're not enough time to <coughs> do anything significant in, but um, you could stand up and sit down again. Sure. Hello, I'm Dave Miller. It's a special Think Out Loud today. We're in conversation with Oregon Governor John Kitzhaber at a City Club of Portland Friday Forum at the Governor Hotel. John Kitzhaber is in the middle of an unprecedented third term as Oregon governor, and the first two years of this term don't look anything like his previous eight years. When he vetoed so many bills, he became known as Dr. No. To a great extent, this time Kitzhaber has led, and the legislature has followed with major overhauls to education and health care, a win for Nike in a hastily arranged special session, and just in the last few weeks, quick approval of a $450 million bond or money for that for the Columbia River crossing. As impressive as that series of wins has been, he and the state still face significant challenges. First among them are the cost of health care and retirement benefits. They're rising faster than the economy as a whole. And if lawmakers can't slow them down, they'll take a bigger and bigger chunk out of the state budget. We're going to talk about all of this and more today. We're going to bring in questions from our audience here at the Governor Hotel. And as always, we'll take your calls and blog comments. Our number is 1-888-665-5865. Our website, opb.org slash thinkoutloud. On Twitter, our hashtag is GovTOL. Governor Kitzhaber, welcome to the show. Thanks, thanks. This is an interesting format for sure. <coughs> Hopefully by the end you'll be a, a major fan of this format. Um, I want to start with, uh, with the, the big focus of, uh, of this budget for you, and, and of I think it's fair to say that the last biennium as well, education. Um, your entire proposed budget has a lot of moving pieces, but behind it, behind all of it, is a desire to bring in more money for education. Why is education the key for you? So um, I'm going to take a few minutes and provide a context here, because this is the most important thing we face. You know, I submitted a budget. The legislature has now submitted a co-chair's budget, which, by the way, is a very nice piece of work. They actually increased the investment level in education, which I totally support, and they also recognize that we're going to need some new revenue in order to meet those targets, and I'm prepared to work with the legislative leadership to get the resources into that budget we need, not just for education, but for our social safety net and other important investments. But if I can just give you a little broader context, since I got elected uh, two years ago, I've been really focused on one pretty simple premise, and that, that is that every Oregonian deserves a shot at the American dream. And to me, that's a commitment to equity and opportunity, to jobs and, and job security, and to safe, secure communities where people have a sense of common purpose and, and, and belonging. And if, as I believe, it is the uh, promise of opportunity that lies at the heart of the American dream, the promise of upward mobility, a promise that hard work is rewarded and that you can leave your kids better off than, than you were, then public education is the vehicle through which that promise is most directly fulfilled uh, today. So if there's one thing I want you to take away from our talk on education is that this is not a one or two year process, it's at least a six to 10 year process. And our success depends on our willingness to have the discipline to make a series of intentional incremental steps over the course of the next decade and move away from simply a myopic focus about how much money we put into the system in a two year period to where we wanna be 10 years from now and how the decisions we made in the last two years and the decisions we're about to make move us in that direction. And to give you some perspective on, on what we're trying to do, I want to share with you a little bit of my personal history. Um, as you know, my uh, parents were, uh, my late parents were both career educators and spent many years teaching at the University of Oregon. A couple of months ago, I was going through some of my dear father's papers and discovered this piece that he had written on his old royal manual typewriter, peck and uh, locate uh, technique. It was called The Short Happy Life of the Sputnik Education Reform Movement. And it was fascinating because it not only spoke to how we ended up in Oregon, but also I think gives a really interesting perspective on the work that we're doing right now. 
Um, although I've got deep roots here in Oregon, one of my ancestors came here across the Oregon Trail. I wasn't born here. I was born in Colfax, Washington, and ended up at a very early age in Lawrence, Kansas, via Pullman, Seattle, and Logan, Utah. And my dad was teaching English at Kansas University of Kansas when in October of 1957, the Russians launched Sputnik 1. And I can still remember sitting on this white shag rug with my mother in our little ranch house watching coverage of this amazing event on the very first television we ever owned that we bought specifically for this purpose, a little black and white job with rabbit ears. And I can remember still going out in the evening and looking up in absolute wonder watching this little speck of light speed across the, 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 the Kansas sky. And to me, this was amazing. And to America, it was very troubling in the depths of the Cold War because it said Russian rocketry was ahead of American rocketry. And so we embarked on this huge reevaluation of our public education system with a focus on math and science to keep up with the Russians. And the Portland public school system was doing exactly the same thing. And they uh, issued a, a request for someone to come in and run the project. And my dad applied and was hired. And thus we escaped from Kansas. And the term, this ain't Kansas anymore, Dorothy, had a whole new meaning for me. Um, and in 1959, he issued this report, which I think was called the Kitsaba Report on High School Curriculum in the Portland Public School System. That was over 50 years ago. Here we are, once again, reevaluating our system of public education, reevaluating how we learn, reevaluating how we teach. Uh, again, a focus on science, technology, engineering, and math because of the importance of technology in our economy and that we're not turning out enough engineers. And while I think it's important to keep up with major international competitors like China, I think there's a much more important reason for us to reevaluate our system of public education, and that reason has everything to do with rebuilding the American middle class, which Jeff apparently is going to be talking about to you next week. The fact is there's an almost linear correlation now between educational attainment and economic attainment and upward mobility and really, really moving into the middle class. When I was elected from Roseburg in 1978, kids were dropping out of Roseburg High School in the 10th grade and getting great jobs in the mills uh, and great benefits. Well, those days are, are gone forever. Uh, today, or in 1978, the average high school uh, college graduate made 35% more than a high school graduate. Today, that's 75%. And, and we know that, that uh, all, most of the jobs that we create in the future are going to require some post-secondary educational experience. So what we've embarked upon, whether you know it or not, in the last two years was a very committed 10-year effort to revitalize and restore public education in Oregon, built around a very aspirational vision. And what's going to make this different than the short, happy life of the Sputnik education reform movement is that vision. And it's a North Star. It's, we call it our 40-40-20 vision. And it's exceptional. And it is also really aspirational. It says that by 2025, we're going to have a 100% high school graduation rate. In other words, when the kids who entered kindergarten last September get to high school, they're all going to graduate. And at least 40% of them are going to uh, get uh, two years of post-secondary education training and another 40% a baccalaureate degree or higher. And that vision is not just numerical targets. It's based on a belief and a commitment. And the belief is that every child in this state can succeed. It's a belief that every child, regardless of home language, income, ethnicity, immigration status, can succeed and has that potential. And it's built on a commitment for adults not just parents and teachers and educators, but every adult in this state meets those kids halfway or where they are and builds pathways to success in career and college. That's the vision. Now, very quickly, there are three obstacles to achieving that vision. The first one is that um, we have a, uh, a, a structure in our educational system that was not designed uh, to meet the realities of the 21st century. It's very siloed. It's not built around, you know, the... Uh, the uh, the outcomes that are necessary for success, success. The second one is this pattern of disinvestment in our general fund, which where we're spending more and more on healthcare and public safety and less and less on children and family and education. And the third one is that the whole enterprise of education is underfunded uh, at a very profound level. O to overcome those obstacles, it's going to take a very, uh, at least six biennia, or three biennia, to, to put us on a trajectory to actually achieve 40, 40, 20. So what I'm hoping we can do in part this morning is talk about what we've done in the last biennium to tee this up, what we're planning to do in this biennium, and how each of those builds on the other and tees us up for an opportunity in the 1517 biennium to have a true education growth budget that allows us to create those pathways to upward mobility and to rebuild the middle class here uh, in the state of Oregon.
as you said, I mean, and, and your vision goes back to you know the the American response to Sputnik, but just more recently, there yeah. are there have been some grand plans to improve both Oregon's and America's education system. Twenty years ago, we had certificates of initial mastery and advanced mastery. Ten years ago, we and the rest of the country had no child left behind, which we no longer have now. We have a waiver for that. Now we have as a, an aspirational goal, 40, 40, 20, what's going to make this work when other grand plans haven't? So here, here's the difference. I was actually in the legislature with Vera Katz when we did uh, the Educational Act for the 21st Century, which had some very important aspects, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the SIM and the CAM and, and sort of the outcomes basis. But we didn't have a 10-year vision. We didn't ask ourselves, where do we want to be 10 or 15 years from now? nor did the Bush administration when we passed No Child Left Behind. It was simply about school accountability without a context. So what makes this different is A, we've got a very clear vision, and it is aspirational, and we ought to, head, we ought to set our sights above the horizon. It's aspirational, and we have a very intentional plan to get there, and we're making incredible progress. And you know, you said earlier that I've led and the legislature followed. That's not true. We've done this together. This is a partnership. And last session, it was a partnership between Republicans and Democrats. And even though the control in the legislature has changed, it will be a partnership between Republicans and Democrats for Oregon to achieve this, this, uh, this aspirational goal. We've got some questions on our website. Bob on our live blog says, while I appreciate the governor's emphasis on increasing funding for education, my experience as a classroom teacher and educational consultant is that the biggest issue facing K-12 education is the quality of instruction. How does the governor propose to hold educators accountable around improving student outcomes? So three quick comments. First of all, we have to recognize that the teachers in our classrooms get what comes in the front door. And because we have a fragmented, sort of unaccountable system of early childhood learning, we bake in the achievement compact for kids when they arrive. And there are factors that have nothing to do with the classroom that affect the ability of these kids to learn. So there's no question, other than the child, the teacher is the most important asset in the classroom. And in this budget, we have recommended resources for teacher, uh, teacher uh, quality, uh, teacher improvement. There, you know, if you look at any country that has moved the dial on educational attainment, they have not done it without a significant investment in their professional workforce. But I want to just add one more thing. How do we hold teachers accountable? We have to have a system of accountability. We got waivers from No Child Left Behind to set up our own supportive system of school evaluation and accountability. But you know something? It is everyone's responsibility, and we all have to be accountable for these kids. Schools don't exist in isolation. They exist in a community. And one of the things we're planning to pilot this year is a regional achievement compact that's not just about inviting teachers and parents and administrators in, but the business community, the civic community, the faith community, everybody in that community has a stake and a responsibility, and I hope a commitment to meet these kids where they are and, 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 and build a pathway for their success. What kind of teeth do you want to see in those compacts if for whatever reason the, the schools or the classrooms or the individual students don't meet the, the hoped for goals, what should happen? First of all, we should go in and diagnose what the problem is. We should ask ourselves, is this basically that 50% that of the kids don't have English as their home language? Is it that kids are living in cars and are coming to school hungry? Or is it weak leadership at the principal level or superintendent level? Or are there, is, are there problems with the teaching force? But we should not make assumptions that because the school or the district isn't achieving that the reason is just the classroom teacher uh, or that it's not the classroom teacher, but we should actually go in and do a thoughtful evaluation and then come in and try to provide supports to get over the bar. You know. Carrots and sticks are important, but it's, here's the difference. Uh, those of you who are in the, con in the construction business, there's a big difference between someone from OSHA coming out with a pair of mirrored glasses and a clipboard and saying, here's 10 things that are wrong with your project, and then leaving, versus someone that comes in and says, yeah, here's, here's some problems. Let's work together to figure out how to fix them. So that's the attitude, and that's the culture with which we're approaching accountability in our system of public education. I want to move on to higher education. Um, Oregon was recently found to have the fastest growing public university system in the nation in terms of, of the number of students, but state funding per student is one of the lowest uh, among every state in the country. University leaders said that they cannot keep this going. They need more funding if they're going to have a, you know, a, a, a world-class education system. When is that money going to come? Yeah, when is it going to come and where is it going to come from is the next question. So again, as I said earlier, the whole enterprise of public education is underfunded from early childhood through post-secondary education. We can't achieve our 40-40-20 goals without a significant reinvestment of resources into our system of public education. We can talk about that in a, in a larger context. On, on post-secondary education, a couple of thoughts. The fact is that there, you can look around the country today and there is not a major world-class university that doesn't have a whole lot of private resources help, helping to support it. 
that's one of the reasons we're actually looking at the idea of developing institutional boards for some of our larger universities to help attract private resources. Now, there's two sides to that sword. You don't want the contributors to control the, you know, the, 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 the output. You don't want to, you know, devalue, you know, humanities and the arts. But that, that is, that is part, of the, part, of the, part of the part of the challenge. The, and in the process of doing that, we need to make sure that we don't price out uh, in-state uh, un un undergraduates. But there's another side to this, and, and I will just throw this out and be a little provocative. We have not examined why the cost of higher education is going up as fast as it, as it does. We've really looked at that in our K-12 system. We really haven't looked at that in post-secondary education. So the other part of the handshake uh, is to obviously, as a part of our larger reinvestment strategy, which we can talk about, we have to put new state money into post-secondary education, and that includes community colleges as well as a university system. But we also have to you know, do a deep dive on, on, on wh why, are the, why are the costs going up so fast and are, is there a commensurate increase in quality and outcomes uh, that uh, aligns with uh, that cost increase. Do you have an initial answer to that question, why the costs are going up so fast? I don't. I do think that, uh, uh, however, that we could prop that there are, are uh, uh, virtual learning is uh, something that's spreading across the country and, and uh, I do think that a, a greater use of of the techno learning technologies that are available out here today as a part of uh, uh, the university teaching approach is, is important. Uh, but uh, I, I think it's definitely something that needs to, be, needs to be looked at. What do you make of Treasurer Ted Wheeler's plan to borrow money, a significant amount of money in the form of bonds, to create uh, a, a new fund that would eventually you know, give money for college students here? Well, I am supportive of the concept. I think that uh, um, clearly it's a matter of, of, uh, of uh, you know, how much we can capitalize that fund and how, how quickly. Uh, I think it's important, however, not to simply limit this to tuition support, but to focus it on helping uh, college, high school students achieve more college credits while they're in high school. If you can get one year of college done in high school, it reduces your college costs by 25%. And it's very, very clear that kids who earn those college credits are more likely to be carried on into post-secondary education to actually stay there and to uh, 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 attain a, a degree. I feel like I'm missing some, some key I point for Ted Wheeler's idea. It does, on some basic level, it doesn't make sense to me, or at least it seems too good to be true. If you can borrow money in the form of bonds and then invest that money in the stock market or mutual funds or you know, some but somehow safe investments to grow an endowment then that you can use in some form of public spending, why doesn't all government run that way? Well, some, I, I would argue that the, the United States government does run that way. Um, but but and, is, and that a good, is it a good model for they a just state? Don't, they just don't have to pay it back. Yeah, we, 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 do, we have different Yet. rules right now yeah. as a state. Yeah. Um, I, th I think that's a fair, uh, a, a fair observation. I think what Ted has done, though, is he has really raised the issue of post-secondary uh, uh, access. I mean, you know, you can turn out great students and we can get 100% high school graduation rate, but if they can't afford post-secondary education, we've got a real problem. And he's really put this on the map. And I, I think what Ted's interest in is trying to figure out how to solve the problem, and he's put one proposal on, on, on the table. I will tell you, just as we uh, talked about my dad, my dad and his generation came home from the Second World War, and they were rewarded by a grateful nation with the GI Bill, which I think was one of the greatest social programs of the last century, it lifted up a whole generation of Americans who repaid their loans many, many times over through increased productivity. And that was at a time when you didn't need a college education to get ahead. And it is a huge irony and contradiction and problem in our nation and in our state that when we know by every metric, post-secondary education is absolutely essential for uh, success in the workforce, we burden our students with huge debts just to go to college, and many of them are getting out today and not being able to find a job that actually requires a four-year education. And that's an issue that we need to take up in, in a, a conversation I'm confident we're going to be having in the context of the Oregon Business Plan. All right, we have a lot more coming up in this show. Uh, coming up after the break, we're going to talk about where the money's going to come from, including proposed changes to PERS. Stay tuned. You're listening to Think Out Loud on OPB. I'm Dave Miller. We're coming to you live today as part of the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum at the Governor Hotel. We're talking to Oregon Governor John Kitzhaber. We're going to turn to proposed changes to PERS right now. If you're a public employee or retiree, we'd love to hear from you. 1-888-665-5865 is our phone number. Our website, opb.org slash thinkoutloud. 
So as I mentioned, I want to move on to, to PERS right now because all the budget frameworks, including your, your first one, um, use changes to PERS as a way to bring more money to schools in particular. What specific changes to PERS are you pushing for right now? Well, there are two. Uh, one is to capture uh, payments to out-of-state taxpayers, which is, I think, is not, not uh, uh, retirees, which is not particularly controversial. And then to cap the, the, the COLA, the cost of living adjustment, at $24,000 a year. So you, not taking it away, but basically limiting it to the first $24,000 of income. 50% of PERS retirees will, I believe, not be affected by that. Uh, a not, uh, maybe it's not 50%, a significant number, and, and, and um, uh, we'll get at least, I think it's 50%, at least 2%, still get the 2%, and then a larger number will get at least 1%. Now, I want to make it really clear that the, the decision to do this has nothing to do with the quality or value of our public employees. It is not uh, a statement that these benefits were not earned. They were. Uh, but the, the reality is that the crisis in school funding and this crisis in, in funding human services is no longer just a revenue problem. It is a revenue problem, but it's also a cost problem. And we have to address th that cost problem in conjunction with a number of other things, which is dramatically reducing the cost of health care and public safety to free those dollars up to invest in education. So I just think it's important to put a context on this uh, debate, and, uh, but I do feel strongly that we need to move in that direction. Uh, the Democrats, the, the co-chairs last week, they released um, their, their version, their proposed budget, and they had, I think, what's called a tiered change to, to the cost of living adjustment, which may, in the end, be sort of similar to what you pushed for. Uh, the Republicans well, wanted to have it be capped at $36,000 as opposed to twenty four, but they also were going to make some changes to the payments to, uh, to current workers. What do you think of the Republican and the Democratic ideas? Well, I still think that uh, two-thirds of the leg of the cost in the system are with retirees. Uh, you know, the, the, a lot of existing workers are essentially funding a retirement system they're not going to see. So I, I don't take a uh, – I'm not very supportive of doing additional things to current workers. We've got a workforce that hasn't – you know, that have been, have, have had been frozen. They're, they've got huge caseload increases. And, you know, they're doing really important stuff. They're protecting kids. They're putting out fires. They're – you know, it, it, so – what I'm trying to do is figure out a balance between trying to have a stable retirement system that respects the service that people have given, but balances the cost of that retirement system with the ability to make investments in our schools today so those kids will be uh, um, uh, successful tomorrow. So I still think looking at something on the retirement side of this equation is the most equitable uh, way to address this cost problem. Both sides of the aisle right now agree with you that, um, that more money has to go to schools, and both sides have, have in, in different ways, but relatively similar ways, said that changes to PERS um, could be the answer, at least one way to get some, some more of that money. On a very basic level, how is this fair? If somebody worked for the state of Oregon, perhaps made less money in salary than they could have if they had been in the private sector, based on either a contractual or a historical understanding that when they, when they finally stopped working, they would get you know, a certain amount of money, and now you're coming along and saying, hey, you, you did really good for us, thank you, but that we need more money as a state for education. It's just not sustainable. How is that fair? Well, in, in one sense, it's not. Uh, you know, these were commitments that were made, but let me put this in a larger context. Every last person in this room is expecting fully funded health care when they turn 65, and uh, the uh, Medicare cost of Medicare is driving our national debt. It will, it will force us to a default unless this federal government, the Congress and the administration, address the cost of health care. So, the fact of the matter is we can make commitments, and we all do that at certain points in our lives, and we need to respect those commitments. But at some point, if they become financially unsustainable, if the choice is to fulfill those commitments and shortchange our kids, uh, it, to me, that's uh, it, it, a troublesome issue. So, yes, there's a fairness question. No question about it. I acknowledge that. But I also think acknowledging it doesn't address the fundamental issue that we have a generation of kids uh, who are likely to be worse off than we for the first time in our history, and we need to invest in those children and their futures, which is really an investment in our workforce and in our larger success, and quite frankly, in the number of people who are going to be able to earn a wage to support the growing retired population. I want to invite uh, members of the City Club who are here in the audience. If you have a question, you can g go up to the, uh, the mic right there. Our phone number for folks in the listening audience is 1-888-665-5865. Our website is opb.org slash think it loud. Go ahead. What's your name? Fred Neal, City Club member, uh, Governor. A geologic survey recently uh, leaked to the Oregonian will soon be released, stating that hundreds of public buildings 
from the state capitol to schoolhouses to courthouses will crumble in a six plus and all too expected earthquake. What thinking or planning process do you anticipate to address this earth shattering concern? Very, very well, very good, well, well done. I'd give you a yellow card if I had one. Um, so I, actually, I don't think we needed a study to come to that conclusion. That, that also goes for bridges uh, on our interstate highways. So here's, I guess here's the conundrum. I mean, I got a report a couple years ago actually on sort of the seismic preparedness of our state. There, there is no way, to be honest, that we have the resources in our state or in our nation to seismically retrofit the number of buildings and structures that need to be retrofitted. We should certainly prioritize school buildings and, and, and have a priority list for the resources we can. The Senate president has been a leader in getting money for these seismic retrofits. But uh, what I think, to me, the real issue is, is the question of the preparedness of the population. How do we respond to this kind of an earthquake? It's, it's not enough to have a day's work of worth of food. You've got to have a couple weeks worth of food. We have to think through uh, how we actually uh, um, uh, deliver emergency services to, to people under those kinds of circumstances. So we will be undertaking a very aggressive uh, uh, a process of preparedness and public education on, on how we prepare our state for a, an earthquake and a tsunami that will probably give us far less notice than the tsunami uh, t uh, two years ago that uh, had an epicenter across the, across the, uh, across the Pacific. Let's take another question from the audience. Edward Hershey, City Club member. Governor, the vast majority of our employees here in Oregon are not public employees. They're in the private sector. Their retirement security situation is virtually impossible. Isn't that a ticking time bomb, and isn't the total workforce retirement security issue one that Oregon ought to deal with and do it quickly? Uh, the short answer is yes. It's not just a problem facing Oregon. It's a national problem, and, you know, there are many roots to that. One of them, and, and I don't know the answer to this question, but I think we have to address it. If you talk, if you, if you look at the, uh, uh, the uh, Oregon business plan, we've got three objectives. One is creating a certain number of jobs. One is driving per capita income up, and one is reducing poverty. The problem is we are, our economy is not creating uh, the kind of jobs that pay enough for people to even live, let alone, uh, let alone put away money for, for retirement. And at the same time, we have a growing income stratification in, 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 in our country. Uh, you know, we lost something like $7.3 million jobs in the recession. We've gained about 47% of them back. I think half those jobs we lost paid, you know, 60 to 60, 50 to 60 thousand dollars. Only two percent of the ones that have come back pay that amount. So, this is a huge problem. It has to do, I think, with the fundamental sort of structure of our economic paradigm. We've got GDP growth uh, and poverty getting worse, and 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 not creating those kinds of jobs. So, I think we need an intentional conversation about how we address that. And part of it, quite frankly, is sort of full cost accounting, both on the economic and on the social side. You have to ask yourself how much it actually costs us as a society when an individual doesn't have enough to retire on. Because they're not going to go away, just like when a kid drops out of school, they don't go away. They show up in our prisons, they show up on the streets, they show up on our health care system, or on our mental health system. Excellent question, not an easy answer, but I think that's something we have to take very, very seriously. And I would argue that <coughs> when you look at the entitlement programs we've uh, set up on the healthcare side, so we have this intersection of a hyperinflationary medical system with 78 million baby boomers. A lot of those resources, if we reformed the national Medicare system in the way we're trying to reform Oregon's Medicaid system, would free up vast resources that could then be applied in some way to try to create a, a retirement security system that would actually um, uh, uh, serve uh, 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 Americans in the future. I want to get to uh, changes to Oregon Health Plan to Medicaid here, but let's take a call first from Curtis in Salem. Curtis, welcome to the show. Yes, hello. Go ahead. Uh, my question is, has anybody considered a buyout option for retirees? I personally am tired of hearing year after year in retirees being blamed for the problems of the state. Uh, Curtis, what do you mean by a buyout option? When you first retire, you, you have the option of cashing out. And now every time you, you hear is everybody wants to roll back their, what they've planned to live on and change the amount they're getting, um, that kind of thing. Okay, thanks for that so call. basically some kind of cash out. We got it. Thanks very much, Curtis. Governor? 
Well, I mean, um, I'm not exactly sure what that looks like. Uh, I, I'm not suggesting anything's off the table. I would have to respectfully disagree just a little bit. I don't think we have over and over again blamed retirees. The changes that we made in the PERS system when I was governor before and the ones uh, under Governor Kulongoski have uh, uh, not to a large extent affected existing retirees. Uh, and I'm certainly not blaming retirees. I'm a PERS-1 retiree myself when I retire. I tried it once and came back, but uh, I, so these, are will, these will affect me as well. And again, I think the conversation should not be about blame. The, the conversation should be about sustainability and our larger community and, and how we take limited resources and allocate them in a way that's fair, not only to those who are retired, but also to those who have not yet retired. Uh, and uh, I, I think reasonable people can, uh, can disagree on the approach to that. Uh, and I have great respect for Oregon public, public workers, uh, but uh, I, I do believe that um, this is an issue we have to find some way uh, to find common ground and consensus on. You mentioned changes to Medicaid. We had Lawrence Fernstall, the CFO of OHSU, on the show a couple days ago. He's a, a big believer in the changes you're pushing for, and, and he's you know fully behind them. But I asked him how financially, how this model is working or <coughs> going to work, going from fee for service for a cardiologist getting money to you know put a stent in or something to as a whole the, the whole system getting money to keep people healthy and and he's a man who's you know in charge of the money for OHSU the largest teaching hospital in the state and he said I don't really know none of us really know yet how this is going to work but yet we have 15 CCOs up and running right now if he doesn't know how this is going to work who does he doesn't know why is he CFO <laughs> he, he do you, do you know? No, just, ki just kidding, Dr. Robertson, just kidding. No, I mean, um, the, but does, does yeah, anybody yeah. know? Does anybody have a way to, to move to this model? Yeah I, yeah, I think we do. And I think the, 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 the first thing we've done here is we've changed the paradigm. I mean, we ask ourselves, what's the purpose of the medical system? Is it to finance and deliver medical care, or is it to keep people healthy? They're completely different objectives. And the fact is, there's no value to health care except as an economic commodity outside its relationship to a health outcome. So we've got a system that's basically built on doing things and getting paid for those things without any relationship to whether or not they lead to health. It is one of the biggest industries in our nation. It's 17% of our GDP, and our population health statistics are not much better than Cuba's. There's something really wrong with that picture. So what we did, and we did it with the inspirational leadership of a lot of bi uh, leg uh, legislators, both sides of the aisle, Speaker Kotek, uh, Tim Freeman, Republican from Roseburg, uh, and, and what we did is basically said, look, we've got to change this business model. And the agreement we made with the federal government was that we will reduce medical inflation in Medicaid, per capita inflation, to 3.4% by the end of next year, from about 5.4%. And we will do that in a way that, that improves health outcomes and, and quality. In exchange, they gave us wide latitude, the ultimate tight, loose model to get this done, and $1.9 billion investment to, to make it happen. And essentially, 80% of the cost in the healthcare system comes from treating people with chronic illnesses. And about 10% of the population drives 70% of the cost. So if you can identify those people with chronic illnesses and manage them in their home and, and, and not bouncing in and out of the hospital, it, it's not actually that complicated. The problem is, is you've got the old delivery model coexisting with the new delivery model. And so you, you, you have to essentially create a series of incentives to help you change that business model, not unlike what, what the investment in the auto industry. It was essentially giving it some resources to redesign itself. So in these, we have 15 CCOs. In this budget, we have a transformation fund for hospitals and one for the coordinated care organization. So if they reduce it, readmissions, which takes money off the hospital bottom line, how can you reward that behavior as you transition to a new business model? And the exciting thing about this is we've got 15 live experiments covering 92% of our Medicaid population. And every four or six weeks, we have a learning collaborative where everyone gets together and talks about you know, how, what's working, what isn't working. And I have to tell you that once you get past the shock of actually realizing you have to redesign your, your business model, there's a lot of excitement out there. And one of the doctors from Southern Oregon said, I am terrified and I'm excited. I'm terrified because we are designing something that's never been built before. And I'm excited because I have the opportunity to build something that's never been built before. Hasn't it sort of been built before? Isn't this basically an HMO? No, an HMO was, it's the same model in terms of capitation, but this, the, the, this, is, a, this is a capitation rate that actually grows at, at, a, at a fixed rate. It's not driven by the actuaries, it's driven by health outcomes. So the idea is to gradually shift the reimbursement 
uh, less and less from volume to actually quality. Uh, what, what's an different. example of how that would work? So I'll to go back to our cardiologist who's right now going to get money for, for uh, doing uh, some kind of procedure. I'll give you an example. This is my famous example. Many of you heard this before, but let's say, let's say you have a 92-year-old woman with well-managed congestive heart failure living in a little unair conditioned apartment in Selwood, and there's a heat wave, and the temperature in her apartment goes up to 105 degrees. Well, that's enough to strain on her cardiovascular system and tip her over, over into full-blown congestive heart failure. Under the current system, you won't know about her until she shows up at Legacy. Under a new system, we'd be paying a community health worker to check on her on a regular basis to make sure not that her, just that her medical needs are being taken care of, but her non-medical needs that can lead to medical problems. Under the current Medicaid program, we will pay for the ambulance and $50,000 uh, to uh, stabilize her in the hospital, but we won't pay for a $200 window air conditioner, which is all she needs to stay in her house and out of the acute medical system. Difference is $49,200. You multiply that hundreds of thousands of times, and you can see what the problem is. So instead of just rewarding people for doing things, you're rewarding people to produce outcomes. And one of the parts of the waiver we got was broad flexibility to pay for the air conditioner instead of the admission for congestive heart failure. Now, y you multiply that enough times and you've taken a lot of revenue, you know, out of uh, the legacy system because you don't get that $50,000. So the challenge is to say, okay, here's where we want to end up, not unlike our 40-40-20 vision. Here's what we want this system to look like six, seven years down the road. What are the incremental steps and incentives that you have to put into the system to make that transition? It's early yet, but are there any real-life examples of, of your woman with the, uh, without the air conditioner or potentially oh, with the air conditioner? There are dozens and dozens of them. In Bend, actually, they're developing a complex uh, care clinic to identify the, the most expensive patients in that Medicaid population and, and, and manage them. In Roseburg, they're integrating mental health services. It's, it's very robust, very exciting. This month, we'll actually have real outcome data that people can look at. And, you know, it's interesting. I've been back to D.C. about three times lately. Uh, because of this issue, the, the National Governors Association, uh, two, two or three weeks ago, there's great interest on the part of other governors to move in this direction, including Governor Brown in, in California, because every governor is being eaten alive by the cost of Medicaid, and we're facing this huge expansion of coverage under the HCA coming in 2014. So... I think this could be one of the answers to this larger question of reducing the back-end cost of Medicare. Uh, let me just add one more thing. The $49,200 we took out of the system didn't take benefits away from that woman. It improved her quality of life and kept her in her own home. That's the frame we've got to approach the, uh, the, the health care reform uh, debate here at the end. We have to take one more break, but we'll be back with more with Governor John Kitzhaber. Stay tuned. This is Think Out Loud. I'm Dave Miller. We're talking today with Governor John Kitzhaber at the Governor Hotel in downtown Portland. It's part of the City Club's Friday Forum series. Let's take some more questions from our audience here. Go ahead. Uh, Bill Dickey, City Club member. Unfortunately, I am stuck in the old model. Kaiser, uh, the Kaiser rep is coming in next week to tell me that we've got a 15% increase in our insurance premium, which is a, you know, 1500 a month, I suppose, because we spend about 10000 a month now for our employees. And it just seems, um, I just, the thing that bothers me the most about it is that this ever increasing escalation of premium from month to month, I mean, from year to year, and at most of the things in my business are still operating at prices that were five, six years ago. I mean, I'm not charging more for the things that that I deliver even to Kaiser as a vendor of theirs. But I'm getting, you know, with this ever increasing price increase and it is really frustrating because it just doesn't make sense. You sit in the room and the chair is the same, the carpeting's the same, the building's not new, but the price goes up. So, Dr. Kitzhaber? <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> I think we I'll got take it. the window air conditioner at least. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. So, um, did a couple of uh, points. The, the Medicaid population is about 16 percent of the Oregon population. That the the changes there, I believe, we will be quite successful in in, in controlling those costs. Uh, but that's not enough to drive systemic change. And so we have a plan. Um, we want to offer uh, on the health insurance exchange this care model uh, as a high uh, quality, uh, a, a low-cost model, and make that available to uh, state employees and public school teachers as a first step. If they were on a care model that grew at 3.4% a year, 
the 10-year savings would be nearly $5 billion. Talk about a reinvestment opportunity for education. Then we are having discussions with private sector employers who recognize that if you take that much money out of the healthcare economy, it's simply going to be shifted through premium increases to the private sector unless private employers align their purchasing with state purchasing to, uh, to, to accelerate the transition to this uh, uh, care model for uh, the private sector as well. So your point is absolutely uh, uh, correct. And uh, we are in the process of actually trying to develop an employer's uh, a purchasing coalition to help uh, align private sector purchasing with, uh, with, uh, with, with the public sector. And the health insurance exchange is going to be a key uh, element in making that happen. Well, Lamet Week had a cover article this week uh, that called into question the entire premise of uh, making major changes to the public safety system. It noted that we have the lowest recidivism rate in the country, one of the lowest rates of incarceration of nonviolent offenders, and one of the lowest overall rates of incarceration. Given all of this, why make major changes to the public safety system? Well, let's not assume that what's written in the Lamet Week is necessarily true. But uh, do you do you disagree <laughs> with? With, uh, uh, with these stats? No, I don't disagree with the stats. I think I disagree with the conclusion. So there's no question that we've got a great public safety system and correctional system, and we are well ahead of the country on a lot of metrics, but we're beginning to trend in the wrong direction. One of the things we did traditionally was viewed public safety like health care. That is, the, the ER is the most expensive care option. You should only use it for people who really need it. That was the, the metric for putting people in prison. We've gradually expanded our net to more and more nonviolent offenders. We also have people who are coming back into prison by uh, technical violation of patrol, uh, parole rather than recertification, re, 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 uh, re, re uh, uh, commitment of a crime. And I guess the analogy I would draw is that we know a lot more now about how to keep people out of prison uh, and how to sanction people than we did 10, 15 years ago. If I went back into the ER and practiced medicine with the same knowledge that I did when I left in 1990, I would be sued for malpractice. All we're saying is that we're trending in the wrong direction, and the trend suggests that we may have to build up to 2,300 new beds at the cost of $600 million. We don't want to do that. We want to ask ourselves, okay, first of all, we want to keep people safe. We're not talking about letting out violent offenders, sex offenders, people who are really a danger to society, but is there a better way, based on good evidence around the country, of sanctioning these people in a way that allows us to keep the community safe and, by the way, make better and more investments in proven community corrections and crime prevention strategies? So that's the debate we're having, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a robust debate, and there's some questions out there, but we should not simply not pursue the debate, particularly because we had an article in the Willamette Week. <laughs> Yesterday, the state Supreme Court heard um, arguments in Gary Haugen's appeal of your decision not to carry out his execution. His lawyer basically argued that an inmate um, has to accept an act of clemency for it to be valid. After the arguments, our own reporter, Christian foden uh, talked to Gary Haugen. This is part of what he said. A reprieve is a gift. It's an act of grace. Um, what he did to me is it's, it's not an act of grace. It's not a gift. He used a reprieve to sit back and, and um, to nullify uh, my ability to exercise my constitutional rights. What's your response to Gary well, Hagen? Well, first, I have no response to Gary Hagen. This isn't really about Gary Hagen. It's about sort of the larger policy of capital punishment in the state of Oregon. I remain convinced that the position that I've taken is constitutional and believe that that's what the Supreme Court will find. You said when you announced not just the reprieve, his reprieve, but that no executions would take place while you're governor, uh, that it was time for a statewide debate uh, on the death penalty. You wanted the legislature to take a lead on that. Um, it didn't get out of, of committee just a couple weeks ago, a, uh, a proposed ballot measure to repeal the death penalty. Now what? Well, I mean, I still believe that this needs to be on the ballot before voters. I mean, it's been years and years and years since we've enacted this, uh, this policy. I, I don't think it's equitable. I, you have some people who are charged with exactly the same crime. Uh, some are sentenced to death, some aren't. Most of the ones that are, the only two people that have been executed in the last 20 years are two people who waived their appeals. I happen to be involved in both of those. I do not think the state was, uh, is better off, safer, or more just th because we made those decisions. And, and um, you know, I have been given that option in the Oregon Constitution, uh, and uh, I w will continue to exercise it. Uh, and I will continue to push for a robust, honest reevaluation of this policy 
Uh, I do believe uh, that we, my preference would be life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. It's swifter, it's more certain, it's less expensive, and it can be equally applied. Now, I know that this is not the majority opinion here in the state of Oregon, but I um, believe this very strongly and will stand by my convictions. If the Supreme Court decides that your reprieve is not, in fact, valid because Gary Haugen didn't uh, agree to it, will you commute his sentence? Uh, no, but I will not execute him either. I mean, I don't know if you understand the process here. You sit in your office, and a phone rings with a code that you have to say to make sure it's you, and they say, is there any reason this execution should not take place? And you can say yes or no. Uh, I've said no twice. Uh, and you sit there by yourself for three or four minutes knowing what's going on and you're the only person on the planet that can stop it. And it's pretty easy to be for capital punishment when you're not the one who actually has to carry that out and has to ask those questions and do that moral searching. And if they call me, I will say, yes, there is a reason this execution should not be carried out. I don't, however, believe that's going to be the decision of the Supreme Court. Let's take one more question from our audience here. Uh, Mary Vogel, City Club member. <coughs> For Chuck Shetikoff of Oregon Public Policy Institute has done some really groundbreaking work on these issues. So if he's either in the audience or waiting on the phone lines, I'd love to see to him to this question. But It's your uh, turn right now, though. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. It, uh, this is about uh, tax policy. And uh, we were lobbied as we came in by... Uh, our Oregon, uh, their little flyer out there, but I, I really like their first two suggestions here of capping uh, overall itemized deductions from wealthy households and uh, capping the mortgage interest deduction. And I wonder if your administration is considering these and, uh, you know, would get behind them. So uh, I do believe that we need to take a serious look at the tax expenditure side of the equation. Uh, I've suggested a couple things, actually, in my State of the State address. One is, uh, is um, reducing the 100 percent deductibility of Schedule A on the federal income tax code. One is looking at a, some kind of a cap on overall deductions. One is the, um, uh, the um, medical deduction, senior medical deduction. You know, anyone over the age of 65, even if they make $20 million a year, gets to deduct all of their medical expenses, which doesn't seem to be particularly equitable to me, although I understand this is a non-starter in Salem. Um, so I do think that, that, there are, that this is a conversation that we ought to have, and we particularly ought to have it in conjunction with the changes that we're making to, uh, to, to, to PERS. I think there's an equity question, and I think we could certainly use the resources, as the co-chairs have pointed out. Their budget is contingent on about $275 million in new resources, and, and these are investments that we're trying to make in, 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 in the protection of kids, in child protective services, in, in, uh, you know, in economic development, and in, in, in education. So this really does need to be part of the debate. One of the big themes in so many of your responses to my questions today and uh, responses to other people's questions is that you're pursuing changes that are going to take a while to implement, whether it's education or health care or, or public safety and on and on. It's not one by any, it's not two, it's more. You, you said 10 to 15 years, I think, for, for education. Six, six, to, six to 10. Six to 10. Fair enough. That's more than Maybe one term as governor. How does that, when, when you look at, at the, your long-term goals for making major changes to so many different parts of Oregon's public structures, how does that play into your decision about whether or not to seek an even more unprecedented fourth term? Well, I mean, obviously, um, uh, once this session is over, my sort of my math is that we have to have a good session. We have to actually take the next series of steps to build on the steps that we took in 2011. I mean, if the train goes off the tracks, and uh, you know, I'd be much less interested in, in, in doing this again. Uh, what would it look like for the train to go off the tracks? What do you mean? Well, I mean, we've got a number of very specific objectives for this upcoming biennium. Them. One of them is to get enough money in the, in the kitty so that we can stem the loss of teachers and school days, not necessarily rebuild, but to stem that loss. We have to continue to roll out our, our, our uh, savings in, in health care and add savings in public safety. Uh, we need to continue to uh, develop our 0 through 20 system to move money from administration into the, into the classroom. We need to continue to, uh, we need the business labor coalition to actually come out with a proposal, a time frame, and a budget for, for long-term uh, 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 revenue reform. And we need to implement our early childhood uh, um, uh, de de delivery model. And so just briefly, if all those things happen, then you'd consider the fourth I term? I would be open to it, but obviously I'm not going to make a decision, uh, you know, in the middle of my uh, second legislative session. Governor John Kitzhaber, thanks very much. Thank you.
Thanks to everybody here at City Club and to the folks at City Club who helped make today possible. Before we say goodbye, you may have heard some of our Our Town shows over the last year. We went to a dozen cities and towns all across the state, from Astoria to Ontario and Warm Springs to Lakeview. Over the next few months, we're going to be continuing that series, but with a focus on the Portland metro area. We're starting Monday night in Portland's Montevilla neighborhood. We're going to be at the Flying Pie Pizzeria on Southeast Stark. The reception starts at 6.30 p.m. The show starts at 7. Again, that's this Monday evening. Thanks so much for tuning in this week. I'm Dave Miller. Have a great weekend. <laughs>